Hello, everyone. Um, great to see everyone. Those who've joined us uh, for the first time, welcome. For those who have been joining us since last week, welcome back. Uh, sorry for the delay. We're just having a few technical issues. It'll be just a couple of minutes. So we've been discussing in the last uh, few webinars, um, talking about communication. We've been talking about improving family dynamics and looking at the opportunity that's being presented during this time of COVID-19. Today, we're gonna to switch gears and gonna talk about a group of people who are immunocompromised and obviously at a higher risk. And those are those with chronic illness. Um, so we have a dear friend, a wine and, and food lover and football fan. We won't go into the team he, he follows, otherwise we might have some people hang up on us. And um, Dr. Norman Chen, who's an incredible endocrinologist, who's going to talk about the challenges with the various form of chronic illness, but at the same time, look at prevention and the new research and the new standards that, uh, that are there. So without further ado, please, let's all welcome Norman Chen. And as usual, please share your comments, your questions, and I will work with Norman to address your questions and your concerns as we move along. Norman, please, the floor is yours. Am I on? Yes, yes Norman. Okay. Yes, Norman, okay. please, please begin. Wow. Sorry about that. He's, he's in our lounge and uh, oh. we're just trying to get things organized. So please, yeah. Dr. Chan, please begin. Some technical problems, but we are finally here. Thank you very much, Faisal, for having me here. And it is a great honor and pleasure to talk to some of the new friends and perhaps some of my old patients right across the globe. Um, now, the talk of today is how to flatten the curve in chronic illnesses. Now, there are many curves to flatten. With regards to COVID-19, uh, we know what, which curve to flatten. And um, I'm trying to give you a flavor with regards to chronic illnesses as to what to specifically to look out for. Uh, the well is going through some important changes. We may never go back to the same well. Uh, as before. And uh, to accommodate that, we must make some changes as regards to chronic illnesses, uh, as these type of patients who are uh, immunocompromised are more susceptible to the current viral illness. So uh, I will begin which is the one to click. Sorry, I'm quite new to this webinar, so there may be some technical issues. Okay, this is the mouse. Thank you very much. Now, the, the obvious curve in chronic illnesses that we need to flatten is the abdominal one. Uh, and we need to really realize the weight issue which underlies all the other chronic illnesses uh, and drives diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, and high cholesterol. Um, as I was saying earlier, the COVID-19 has really changed the world uh, and it has created many crises right across different countries. And, and that also presents a lot of challenges. There are many challenges ahead at different levels. And at a patient's level, we also face uh, many um, such challenges and I will highlight some of them. For instance, in people with diabetes, we all know about the chronic complications such as uh, diabetic foot ulcer, uh, kidney disease, retinopathy, stroke, um, uh, amputation of the leg, uh, and heart attacks. Now, all these complications are chronic. And what we are concerned about today is something that's more acute. All these chronic complications will take uh, years uh, to develop, whereas acute problems can occur anytime. Now, the imminent problem facing us is COVID-19 plus other acute infections. People with diabetes, because they have high blood sugar, they are more prone to this acute infection. And if they do develop this infection, they are more likely to have a worse outcome. 
Now, we all know that the coronavirus, uh, the thing it will cause is pneumonia, infection of the lung. I would like to point out that although most of the cases, if you look at the well data, they actually recover, the mortality rate is approximately 3 to 5%. But for the patients who actually develop severe pneumonia, their pneumonia is actually more widespread. The right-hand side picture is the cross-section of the lungs by CT scan. You can see the white areas are all areas of infection. And these patients are more likely uh, to be intubated in ICU and they are more likely to die. So this type of uh, pneumonia is different compared to other types where it affects predominantly uh, one lobe or maybe two. So people with diabetes are much more susceptible to uh, this type of infection. Now, when one develops pneumonia, uh, one thing that will happen in the body is that we would develop acute infection and inflammation as a result. There will be an increase in markers like uh, C-reactive protein and other acute inflammatory markers. And that has a um, intimate relation with the coronary arteries because in many patients, especially those with diabetes, they may already have silent atheromatous plaques, the yellowy uh, material you can see here, that's accumulated over the years in the arteries. Cholesterol would be another, uh, high cholesterol would be another risk factor for that. Now, when we develop pneumonia and have very high inflammatory markers in the blood, this can trigger off the rupture of a fibrous cap which covers it. And therefore, the plaque can rupture, leading to clots formation. And the clots can block an artery immediately in the acute stage, causing a heart attack. So pneumonia and heart attacks are closely related. Uh, it doesn't matter what the pneumonia is caused by. It could be COVID-19, it could be other types of infection. So essentially, the point I'm trying to get across is that if you have chronic illnesses and if you have coronary plaques, you are more likely to suffer an acute heart attack in the context of uh, acute pneumonia. Now, for people with diabetes, we know uh, it is um, closely linked to coronary heart disease. It's a bit like a coin. If you flip it one side, it's diabetes. If you flip it the other, it's coronary heart disease. So they are really closely linked. And it is well known from global data that people with diabetes are more likely to suffer from heart disease by two to four times. And the longer the disease duration goes on, the greater is the risk of the heart disease. So the COVID-19 uh, era has given us an opportunity to do something that we don't normally do. We have to be uh, more aware of our lifestyle. Uh, someone may have been smoking cigarettes, which is a, another risk factor for heart disease for 10, 20 years. This may be a good time for them to quit because not only cigarette smoking increases risk of coronary heart disease, it also damages your lungs such that you are more prone to pneumonia causing by any kind of organism. Uh, it's about time to look at your body weight and try and get, the, you have more time and therefore you should be trying to lose more weight. Your diabetes control should be much tighter so that you are less likely to suffer infection during this critical uh, time frame. Furthermore, your blood pressure and cholesterol control also should be tightened uh, so that you are at an overall reduced risk in developing coronary heart disease and stroke. And during this time, perhaps you will have the free time to do a checkup of your heart, which you have put away uh, for many months. So it is time to reflect uh, and look at your own health and uh, to see whether we should make changes. Or rather, it's about time to make changes. With regards to diabetes, the first thing we need to look at is whether our overall control is to target. If we are not to target, then we are kind of immunocompromised in a way and more susceptible 
to this acute infection. So how do we get to target the HbA1c level for those who have diabetes? We know this very well. Glycated hemoglobin, the level should be below 6.5%. Is it time that we should be changing the medication? Should we be moving on from oral drugs to insulin, for, ex for example? And you should be consulting your doctors to address this question. Are you really doing home glucose monitoring using fingerprints? Maybe you have been putting it away for quite a while, uh, <clears throat> and then perhaps you should start doing it again. And also we should be looking at some new device like glucose sensors that will allow you to look at your whole day glucose profile and make changes so that you can smooth out the, the peaks and troughs um, uh, and smooth out the curves. Now one thing to mention is that one of the new, um, well, slightly older uh, model called Dexcom G5. Uh, if you are using this particular model as glucose sensor, during uh, acute fever, uh, a lot of patients will be taking paracetamol at high dose to reduce the fever. And for those patients who's using Dexcom G5, the dosage of paracetamol can interfere with the accuracy of the glucose reading. So this is something that's worth knowing if you are using this slightly older model uh, in the context of uh, acute infection. And as I was saying all along, the heart is very important. If you are a diabetic and if your age is over 50, perhaps it is an opportunity now to check your heart. A resting ECG or even a treadmill test is not really that accurate. Uh, and uh, the current gold standard is a coronary CT scan, which involves injection of contrast and can be done outside a hospital. So I would urge everybody who have diabetes or uh, the age of over 50, with or without high cholesterol, you should really do a coronary CT scan. The CT scanner is, as shown here, very simple, like a donut-shaped uh, uh, machine, and you lie on the couch and move inside. It will allow us to give really clear visual pictures of each of your coronary arteries. Moving away from the heart, another very key organ is the liver. In patients who suffer from diabetes, uh, over 80% of them, we will have, to some degree, fatty liver. Fatty liver means there's accumulation of fat in the liver, uh, more than 5%. And the liver is a very important uh, organ for glucose homeostasis, such that it will store glucose in the form of glycogen. I often tell my patient that the liver is a bit like a bank. If you have too much cash, you need to put it into the bank for storage. And when you are short of cash, the bank will release it um, for utilization. The same here, the glucose is stored into the liver as glycogen and vice versa uh, for release. And these are controlled by two very important hormones, insulin that brings glucose into the liver and the other one called glycogen uh, that would uh, take glucose out of the liver for utilization. And it is the balance of these hormones that determines whether one has diabetes or not. So when you have severe fatty liver, then what will happen is that the body, the pancreas is gonna produce much more insulin in order to bring the glucose into the liver. And uh, over time, the pancreas is going to lose its reserve and by that time, people will start developing abnormally high glucose and uh, progress into diabetes. So how do we check for fatty liver? The state-of-the-art uh, measurement currently is using a machine called FibroScan. It is not a new machine, but has been much more popular over the last three to five years, and much more research is using this. This is essentially involving uh, a high-technology uh, ultrasound light machine using a probe uh, directed to your liver. It doesn't move around, it stays in one position and takes pictures uh, using sound wave reflection. 
uh, it is, there is no radiation and therefore it is very safe. It is more precise and accurate than an ultrasound because it gives the result in numbers rather than a vague description of mild, moderate or severe. In addition to uh, assessing the degree of fat in the liver, it can also assess whether the patient has early fibrosis. Fibrosis is an early stage of cirrhosis that will happen if you have chronic fat accumulation or if you have other forms of liver disease such as hepatitis. For fatty liver disease, if you do not do anything about it, it's going to slowly progress into uh, uh, liver hepatitis and gradually develop fibrosis and ultimately cirrhosis. Uh, at the later stage, it may not be reversible. Here you will see the word non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is the majority of the fatty liver disease that we see. For alcoholics, they develop a much more progressive disease called alcoholic fatty liver disease. So if we have diabetes and if we have fatty liver, how are we going to deal with it? Now lifestyle uh, is very important. A balanced diet, low fat, um, low sugar and uh, low carbohydrate essentially, and also a bit of aerobic exercise. There are some supplements which is particularly good for uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, the, the main one is vitamin E. You can see that vitamin E is available in these type of foods. But people with fatty liver is not deficient. They are not deficient of vitamin E. What we are using vitamin E uh, is as an antioxidant. That will give them an antioxidation effect to protect the liver. You can see here this busy chart that um, in people with vitamin E deficiency, um, the nutritional range, uh, there's some benefit, particularly for asthma. Uh, if you give them supplement, then there is, uh, you can improve male fertility and even reduce prostate cancer. But if you give them higher dosage, uh, and you will benefit from other conditions. Here we highlighted diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, and very commonly fatty liver disease. So vitamin E is a very useful antioxidant. This is a medical slide uh, showing that uh, the importance of vitamin E has been known for over 10 years ago. You can see that in this important publication of New England Journal of Medicine 10 years ago, uh, in a group of 200, just under 250 um, non-diabetic patients, uh, three types of interventions were given over a period of 19, 96 weeks. Pioglitazone is an anti-diabetic medicine which is very useful for reducing fatty liver, even in non-diabetic patients. So comparing pioglitazone with vitamin E and placebo, we can see that vitamin E at 800 IU per day is very similar in its effect in protecting uh, fatty liver. And these patients are all uh, having, they all had liver biopsy to prove the degree of uh, liver fat. So we know about vitamin E, which is very useful. What about diet? Now, there's a lot of talks about ketogenic diet, which is very popular and fashionable in these days. There's absolutely no doubt that ketogenic diet can help people to lose weight, but it is not useful for fatty liver because in a ketogenic diet, what you are avoiding is carbohydrate. But to balance that, you'll be eating a lot more meat and more fatty food. And this is not good for cholesterol and it's not good for fatty liver disease. Uh, and furthermore, if you take ketogenic diet, it is not sustainable and you can feel quite tired. And it's definitely not good for people with diabetes when you put them at risk in developing an important complication called ketoacidosis, which can cause death. Now, uh, vitamin E is an important supplement for fatty liver disease. Another important supplement is called astaxanthin. Astaxanthin is actually uh, um, a sea algae extract uh, present in a lot of seafood, such as shrimps or salmon. Um, it is a very important antioxidant that has been studied in animals as well as humans. It causes uh, a reduction in liver inflammation 
and reducing insulin resistance. And ultimately, it helps um, fatty liver disease as well as diabetes. Very interestingly, in some animal studies involving rats or mice, um, they were given um, astaxanthin and another group given placebo. And when they are fed very high fat diet, and you can see that in the end of the 10 weeks, the fatty liver disease extent is lesser in those who were treated with astaxanthin. And there's nowadays a lot of human studies are also looking at this issue uh, with similar uh, results. And now we know that the way that astaxanthin helps um, it, partly because of it alters the gut bacteria. Now, in COVID-19, uh, a lot of patients are, are susceptible to infection. Now, we now come to know that from many epidemiological studies that vitamin D, where, what we get from the sun and a lot of fatty fish, is actually very important in the prevention of respiratory disease through various cellular mechanisms. And uh, for patients particularly with diabetes, I now routinely check their vitamin D levels because if they are low in vitamin D, it can affect their cells for a protective mechanism against viral illness, particularly uh, against respiratory disease. And particularly nowadays, we have advised people to stay indoors and there will be even less sunlight exposure. And therefore, they are more susceptible to vitamin D deficiency. And vitamin D, we traditionally know that it is good for bones, but nowadays it is also good for prevention of acute infection. Now, um, changing the subject a little bit, we talk about quarantines every day. We are isolating ourselves every day. Does anybody recognize this place? Which city is designed around quarantine? This is a beautiful picture. In fact, it is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Anybody? Well, the answer is, this is in Croatia. The south of Croatia, there's a beautiful town, a seaport called Dubrovnik. And Dubrovnik in the 13th century has faced a lot of infectious disease uh, importing from outside and particularly leprosy. And therefore, they have built a place uh, specifically by the, the seaport called Lazaretto uh, in the 14th century in order to isolate these people uh, to do quarantine. And so therefore, this beautiful place is actually uh, designed to help people for separation in order not to uh, catch the infection. Now, as you know, the, um, this town is right next to the border of Italy. Uh, Croatia is right next to Italy. And the word uh, quarantine actually came from an Italian word for quarantino. Okay. So I find this very, very interesting. Talking about quarantine is about social distancing, isolation. And this uh, has, shown, has been shown to really flatten the curve, particularly wearing a uh, face mask. And the result of that may not all that be desired. If you are not disciplined, then you can stay at home, snacking more, uh, doing less exercise as all the gyms are closed, and you develop obesity. Uh, and this can be a real problem, as I have seen in some of my diabetic patients already in the clinic. And we also know that from uh, the current infection in different countries, that overweight patients, if they do get the disease, they tend to be more critical and their health tends to go downhill much more rapidly. And therefore, weight reduction uh, way before not only is good for chronic illnesses, but also good for disease, even if you catch it. One way to deal with uh, weight reduction is exercise. Now, most of the gyms are closed, and we in Hong Kong here uh, are very privileged with beautiful tra trails uh, to climb the peak uh, and to do hiking. And I'm sure many of those who live in Hong Kong have done this, particularly uh, when you can get some more fresh air. But unfortunately, in this current era, 
everybody is thinking of the same, and therefore uh, a lot of the beautiful area becomes more overcrowded. And I think we should avoid using going to these places during peak hours, uh, such as public holidays. We also need to be careful with regarding uh, adequate hydration, because a lot of the diabetic patients, they take certain medication, uh, for example, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, such as for Sika uh, or Jardians, this type of medication, it will make you dehydrate and make you urinate out the excess glucose. And therefore, adequate hydration is so important. Another uh, important element is about appropriate footwear. I have recently had a patient who developed foot ulcer. Uh, you can see on the picture uh, at the bottom there. That's because he was wearing uh, inappropriate, very tight shoes, walking uh, uh, on, on, on trails for long hours, and this will happen. And worse, they have a degree of neuropathy such that they cannot feel the pain. And by the time they finish the, 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 the hiking, they already develop a nasty ulcer. Uh, that requires minor surgical debridement and intravenous antibiotics. So potentially this can be very serious. The other thing to watch out for is on long trials, uh, we should avoid because we need to go to the toilet and one really should be avoiding public toilet during this critical time frame. Now, lifestyle is important in weight reduction, but there are certain medication also helps. GLP-1, is called glucagon light peptide 1, uh, is a group of drugs by injection which can really help our appetite and reduce our stomach emptying uh, so that we have a sensation of fullness. Uh, and the overall effect is that it reduces our appetite and help to lose weight. Besides, it also has other effects on various other organs. And it is a useful drug for people with diabetes. It is also licensed to treat uh, overweight and or obesity in patients who don't have diabetes because it's perfectly safe using it alone uh, and it doesn't cause hypoglycemia, which means a crash of glucose going too low. So this is a very useful drug, which I've been using in conjunction with lifestyle uh, modification uh, in many of my patients. I would just like to show you here a very successful example of a patient who doesn't have diabetes. This is Madam Wong. Well, I first met her in January last year, and she was really overweight. Her body weight was 117 kilo, BMI 45, and she had severe fatty liver when we did the fibro scan. And that's the picture of her. We asked her to do all the things that she should be doing, and luckily she's very compliant, especially with regards to exercise. She does it half an hour, not more, just half an hour, every day, uh, and follow our dietitian's advice. And I prescribed her uh, this GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist uh, as an injection form of medicine that uh, is give, was given daily. So you can see that over a period of eight months, her weight has dropped dramatically by 43 kilos, okay? And she has been feeling well throughout this time and her fatty liver has resolved. Um, and she felt really good at, at the moment. She's still coming back to my clinic on no medication and able to keep her weight around 70 kilos. So this is a really spectacular and yet real story uh, of weight reduction. And uh, I've written a case report on this lady uh, and uh, highlighted the importance of some of the drug treatment that can really benefit life in conjunction with lifestyle can really benefit uh, weight reduction, particularly in patients suffering from chronic illnesses. Now, uh, I would like to introduce the concept of residual risk. We all know about what causes heart disease. We can all name it. Cigarette smoking, overweight, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol. Now, if we address all these risk factors, like in this study, like all the targets are reached with regards to blood sugar, blood pressure, 
and cholesterol in patients with diabetes. This is real data published by Professor Juliana Chen in the Chinese University way over 10 years ago. We can see that when all the targets are reached, the curve doesn't flatten. And what is left is called residual risk. Now, this is a real challenge. How to make this curve completely flat? Uh, we need to recognize additional factors. And also, our previous guidance telling us about what targets should be met uh, is actually out of date. And there are newer guidelines as to what these targets should be and we should, know, we should all know about it. For instance, new guidelines suggest that a normal blood pressure is no longer 140 over 80. And the WHO uh, has uh, a couple of years ago uh, redefined what is hypertension. It should be below 130 over 80. And therefore, our blood pressure target should be lowered. Another important target to reach or meet is LDL cholesterol. It stands for low density lipoprotein cholesterol, which is the bad cholesterol. Now, in people with the highest risk, for example, patients with diabetes, already got coronary disease, had a heart attack, or previously had stents inserted into the coronary arteries, these patients are at the greatest risk. Their LDL must be below 1.4 millimoles per liter. And this is the latest guideline that was published end of last year by the EAS and uh, European Society of Cardiology, showing that at the highest risk, your level must be below 1.4. Another important marker that we seldom measure, uh, which explains part of the residual risk that we still face, is lipoprotein little a. What is lipoprotein little a? Essentially, it is a molecule very similar to LDL bad cholesterol. And it is not uh, coming from the food. There isn't anything that we can avoid eating uh, in order to reduce it it is a hereditary risk marker. In other words, uh, people are born with high lipoprotein to A. One needs to do a measurement uh, to see whether this is indeed high. Uh, as, uh, as doctors, we often see patients who apparently have not many risk factors, and yet they have a heart attack when they were young. And this is, could be something that we have missed. Now, how to achieve an LDL target of 1.4? millimoles per liter. We know that the traditional uh, oral medication, um, statins, uh, they are not very powerful and also at high dose they can cause side effects. For instance, my, my, myalgia, muscle pain, joint pain, liver enzymes can go up uh, and uh, people can develop diabetes on high dose statin. And over the last three years uh, in Hong Kong we have a new uh, way of treating cholesterol uh, that has a gr much greater potency. It's called PCSK9 inhibitor, comes by injection. It's a once every two weekly shot, uh, a bit like insulin under the skin, and the pen device is disposable. Uh, it has very little side effects and none of the statin side effects. And it is able to reduce the LDL by something like 50 to 60%. So sometimes it needs to be used in conjunction with statin. And large-scale landmark clinical trials have shown that it can reduce uh, endpoints, for instance, people dying from heart disease or stroke. But is it all that simple? If you deal with all these risk factors, can we prevent death from coronary disease? Not really, because if you look at some examples, like Sir Winston Churchill, he has all the risk factors you can name of. He had heart attack and um, strokes in the past. Uh, with uh, regular cigar smoking. He actually lived to the age of 90. In contrast, we've got very fit young sportsmen playing professional football. At the age of 37, uh, this um, Real Madrid goalkeeper actually had a heart attack during training. This was in the news last year. So how do we explain all this? It must be epigenomics. And uh, I think it's important that we develop in this area to see who are born to be at risk and therefore their traditional risk factor perhaps should be treated uh, much more stringently. So we have talked a lot about 
diabetes, chronic illness, fatty liver disease, and in the context of COVID-19, I think it is about time that we uh, pay a, a really serious notice to the points I've mentioned, and perhaps we should really be addressing these changes. We must make some changes to change our current. Um, our life is changing, and we must change our disease if it's not, if it's not well controlled. And uh, we should embrace these type of changes. And with that, I thank you for your attention. So Dr. Chan, so we have a number of questions. We'll just go one by one. So first is that you mentioned that the ketogenetic diet is not sustainable long-term. What about a cyclical keto ketogenomic diet in which you come out of ketosis at least once a week? What are your, what are your comments? I, th I think it is possible, uh, but I think you have to watch your cholesterol and triglycerides. If by doing this intermittent, if you want to call this intermittent ketogenic diet, uh, and these numbers do not go up to dangerous level uh, while you're losing weight, then yes. But I still advise diabetic patients to avoid this altogether, particularly type 1 diabetes or those treated with insulin. Um, they are not suitable for this type of diet at all. How frequently should this blood test be done just so that they know when you're saying? Oh, I think once a uh, well, just check it. If you change your diet, do it a month later or two months later. And if you know okay. your numbers are not going up, you can continue. Okay, so upon, how about high triglycerides? Causes treatment for both medical and non-medical. And then a question on those with very strong family history of high cholesterol. What are your recommendations? You know, most of us are genetically predisposed. So, um. now, talking about triglycerides, uh, triglycerides in the ranking of our traditional coronary heart disease risk factors, it doesn't rank very high on the list. It is bottom, but it doesn't mean that it is not important because it can make the LDL, if it's high, if triglycerides high, it can make the LDL more uh, atherogenic, which means more toxic to the arteries. Uh, and when it is very high, it increases the risk of pancreatitis. So how do we deal with the high triglyceride issue? Most patients with high triglyceride, they have fatty liver. So by treating fatty liver, uh, you indirectly uh, make their triglyceride lower. Diet plays a very important role. And for patients who have diabetes, if their triglyceride is high, it's often an indication that the diabetes is not well controlled. And therefore, by being more aggressive in treating your diabetic control, for example, changing oral drugs to insulin, that can also reduce your triglyceride. Now, if all this doesn't apply to you, your triglyceride is still high, that means you need specific treatment, drug treatment for triglyceride, and that's fibrates. Fibrates is similar to statins, and it works at the liver level to reduce your triglycerides. It can be uh, used with certain statins, but only certain triglycerides. Otherwise, it can cause muscle damage. So it has to be, uh, you have to consult your doctors uh, if you were to combine these two of drug, kinds of drugs. And fatty liver is something that is the commonest cause for high triglycerides. With regards to family history uh, of uh, high cholesterol, there is a genetic condition called familial hyperlipidemia. In short, we call it FH, familial hyperlipidemia. These are the kids who are born with high cholesterol. And you know it because their parents can tell you that they already have that problem and they anticipated the children have the same problem. And these patients are oft, can often show it uh, on their skins or on their eyes because they may have some plaque deposition on their tendons, especially the elbows or, or the ankle joints. And you may sometimes see the yellowy deposit on their eyelids. And they may even have arcus on their uh, cornea in the eyes. But anyway, these patients, they should be treated very early on, I would say from the age 18 onwards. Otherwise, they would develop heart disease or stroke when they are in their 20s or early 30s. This is a really serious problem. Luckily, it's not a very common problem, but important to screen for. Those, those with high triglyceride and high cholesterol, 
Um, obviously, most of us would prefer to postpone the medicines and the statins for as long as possible and focus on lifestyle. How much time should we give for those lifestyle changes to kick in before we quote unquote succumb to the medicines, you know, I mean, uh, and, and, and that space? Very good question. And I think it depends on your status, your disease or rather health status. For instance, uh, a 38 year old healthy man who exercises a lot, doesn't watch his diet, has high cholesterol, no other conditions, no family history, then he has only one single risk factor. You can give him six months uh, to all alter his diet to see whether his cholesterol come down to a satisfactory level. In contrast, with a 65 year old who has diabetes, already had stents put into his coronary arteries, this patient you cannot do without drug therapy. And this, if you ask 10 doctors, they will tell you all the same. This patient must be treated with drugs because they're much more potent and um, the level needs to be even lower. So in other words, which level of cholesterol you should aim for really depends on your disease status. The other point is about, about diet is that cholesterol is synthesized, is manufactured in the liver, 80% of it. So a dietary change may only change 20 to 30% of your level. If your level is very high, then you probably cannot just do it by diet alone. So, so, you're, so, so if I am predisp predisposed, which, which I am, would you have a lower target for me versus what you just shared in terms of LDL of 1.4 yes, and, and for the sugar HbA1c, or would you keep it the same level as my target because I'm familiarly disposed? Uh, for HbA1c, there is no benefit in lower than 6.5. So I wouldn't. If anything, by more aggressive treatment, I'm going to make things worse because I would make, give you a hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia can cause heart attack too. So when you reach 6.5, that's enough. But for LDL, there may be some evidence that uh, even the lower, the even the better. Uh, we just don't have the clinical trial to show it. But we, every so often, we come across uh, patients who have heart attacks who are not very old without other risk factors. The cholesterol are actually not that high. And for these patients, I would lower it even further. So I think every single patient should be uh, individualized, treatly treated, uh, and should be tailor-made to their therapy. Okay, we have a question on, I don't even know how to say this, astaxactin, whatever you said was. Astaxactin. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm not as eloquent as you. So is that, I assume they're asking that's prescribed by an endocrinologist and what dose would it be decided by the endocrinologist or is it something that's available over the counter? It is indeed available over the counter. There are many brands. It is actually beta carotenoid, something again, the carrots as well, similar biochemical structure. And the dosage we use, it really depends on what we are using it for. For instance, in a patient with very severe fatty liver disease, I would use a dosage of 12 to 16 milligrams per day. But for other things like for skincare, uh, they even have cream available, then you don't need such a uh, high dose. You can use the lower dose. Um, but as supplements, it can be obtained over the counter. It does not have to be prescribed. Uh, in, in a different tone. So as one gets older and strength and motivations presumably lessens, are there specific exercises and methods of monitoring its effectiveness that are recommended? Can you repeat the last bit? I, I didn't quite hear. So as one gets older yep. and strength and motivation presumably lessens, are yes. there specific exercises and methods of monitoring its effectiveness that are recommended? Yes. Okay. Very good question. And I think when uh, we're talking about different gender here, when men, for example, over the age of 40, then our testosterone level begins to drop, okay? It's a bit like the male menopause. And we all know that testosterone level is very important in muscle building. And this type of uh, patients, 
when they do high intensity exercise, they are more likely to injure themselves. And therefore, I would recommend low intensity exercise and gradually build up the muscle. Uh, it needs to be guided by a medical physical trainer in conjunction with a doctor uh, to monitor the body composition. We usually use a in-body machine which will give us very detailed uh, composition of our body water, body fat and body muscle uh, and we track it that way. So our aim is not to go and run a marathon but gradually uh, build up the muscle strength uh, and it comes at a different stages uh, when this muscle is built up at a later stage then a bit more cardio can be introduced but obviously that also depends on the disease status for, for instance does the patient have high blood pressure when they exercise the blood pressure will go through the roof or when they have cardiac conditions or when they have joint problems that wouldn't allow them the, the vigorous uh, ability to, to do more vigorous exercise so there are many factors to consider, but that's a, an example of what we need to think about. Um, you didn't touch anything on hypothyroidism. Um, and is there any connection between that, this and other, other chronic illnesses? Hypothyroidism or hypothyroidism uh, is an endocrine disease that is not directly connected to what I've been talking about. However, Untreated hypothyroidism can give you very high cholesterol. So for patients with unexplained high cholesterol and you are thinking of family history and yet it's negative, check their thyroid status. They may well be hypothyroid. But they are generally quite easy to treat uh, by an endocrinologist and they are not really, uh, if you are treated, then it's not usually a problem and doesn't predispose you from coronary heart disease or stroke. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you. Um, if you listen to somebody like Sadhguru, who will, will share and say 40% of disease is invasive, virus, infection, and they come from the outside. So you go externally. Sorry to, to, to put that down. It's, you know, you go to the doctors and, and practitioners to help you. 60% are self-generated, right? So when a car goes bad and there's a there's a manufacturing defect. You don't go to the mechanic, you go to the manufacturer, which is ourselves. What are your comments on that? Because how much can we fix? I know you've shared, but which ones do you feel we can truly take care of on our own without having to seek help externally? Uh -huh. um, well, where do we start? I think let's start with the 60%. And I think 60% uh, of disease we create on our own. We must uh, adopt a very good lifestyle right from the beginning. For example, we should be teaching our kids right at this age. Uh, for example, when they are 16, 18, make sure they are not overweight uh, and make sure they have a regular uh, lifestyle with good diet and balanced with exercise. Then theoretically, one should never get chronic illness. Of course, life is not so simple. There are work environment, friends, peer influence, media, the wrong type of advertisement what you read uh, on the newspaper and all that, that will alter people's behavior. So there's a limit of what we can do, but nevertheless, public education on the, uh, repeatedly um, will, will help, but I don't think it will eradicate all of that 60% of chronic illnesses or self-inflicted illnesses. And if you, do, if you can prevent some of those chronic illnesses I mentioned earlier, you are less susceptible to that 40% of acute infection, that's something you have no control of. Having said that, you're not completely, you do not, well, you still have a degree of control if you pay attention to personal hygiene and, um, uh, and a lot of the infection can still be prevented. But sometimes you just have a bad luck, somebody cough right next to you and you're unprotected, then there you go. So I think a lot of both 40% and 60% can be prevented uh, if you are cautious uh, and be careful. Do I answer your question? Yes, yes. I mean, myself, I've been, I've, my, my cholesterol has been borderline since I was 15, 16 years old. And uh, I don't drink, I don't smoke, um, I exercise every day. Now, what about stress? Something that you haven't talked about, you know, the favorite yes. word, stress or, yeah. or yeah. you know, and, and that space, what, and, and sleep right? Two elements that we look at when we 
look at the beyond medical side, right? So sleep, emotion, and, and, and thought, which is the stress side. What, what, are your, um, what are your comments from that space? I certainly think lack of sleep uh, and stress can lead to chronic illnesses indirectly. And this is actually a talk on its own uh, at a separate time by somebody in the area. But with regards to chronic illnesses, I think a lot of it is created or uh, these two factors are very important in uh, making people put on weight and develop chronic illnesses like diabetes, stress and insomnia. How do we deal with it? Well, we have to ask where these come from. The certain family dynamics, um, particularly with the cur current situation with whole family uh, quarantine in a, in a flat, which may, may not be very big, and there may be arguments or conflicts. Uh, for instance, this, uh, in, the, in the COVID era, uh, and insomnia, job, uh, and other factors that will all play a part. It's up to one to find a solution, how to uh, relax yourself, uh, maybe seeing a clinical psychologist will help uh, and help to address the family dynamics uh, during this difficult time. Well, Dr. Norman Chen, we're almost at towards the end. Um, is there any what uh, is there anything else you'd like to share to to as opportunities for everyone that is there? I know some of them are in lockdown. We in Hong Kong have a little bit more of a luxury where we're still able to move around we, yes. you know, with with our distancing. Um, anything else you'd like to share in closing? Yeah, sure. I, in, in closing, I would like to share with you all that uh, discipline is the key. And we as citizens, we have the responsibility to follow the policy that is set by the authorities. So I think uh, I would urge everybody to be a responsible citizen for yourself and your family, particularly when you live in a family where you have elderly, you don't want to be at risk and subsequently uh, infect the others. So I think one word to take home is be disciplined uh, in the current situation. All right, Dr. Chen, thank you very much for the generosity of your time. Thank you for, for, thank you. for sharing all that wisdom. Uh, we'll be sharing your slides with everyone, even though some of them were quite uh, difficult to digest. Luckily for some of us, we've already had lunch. Others in Dubai are about to. And um, really thank you very much everyone for being here. Uh, tomorrow we will be here with uh, Roger, Roger King to discuss um, how we can achieve family longevity and generational continuity through the three Ps, which is wealth preservation, harmony and, continu harmony and unity, and value preservation. So thank you very much, everyone. See you tomorrow. Thank you, Dr. Chan, once again. Truly, truly grateful for your time, wisdom, and sharing. Thank you.